So I'm Jason, I'm the co-founder and CEO of SIFT Science. Uh, I'll give you a quick rundown of what we do, but then I'm going to talk a little bit more about machine learning and how it applies to fraud and some of the challenges of building a machine learning system applied to fraud. So SIFT Science, we help online businesses stop fraud using large-scale real-time machine learning. Um, we've been around for roughly three years, just coming up on, in June. Uh, we have 25 people out in San Francisco, uh, just closed our Series B uh, recently, and we have about 175 customers around the world, including Twitter, Square, Match.com, OpenTable, Uber, Airbnb, Kickstarter, and others. Um, we are taking this technology that Google has been able to build, you know, sort of the Amazon quality machine learning technology, and making it really simple to integrate, packaging it behind a really sim easy uh, API that online businesses can just plug and play in a day. That's really the, the core value. But, what we're going to talk about is really three things. First, what's machine learning? I, I got the sense that you know half of this audience could be non-technical, so I want to have something for everyone here. The second is you know how does it apply to fraud? The third is how would you build your own system to, to, to really battle this problem if you were an online business? Um, I'm going to do something pretty challenging, which is go through 90 slides in 15 minutes. Um, it comes out to roughly 10 seconds per slide. I've already burned some time with this intro. Uh, we might not get through it all, but feel free to you know, shoot me questions, tweet at me. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys can keep up with my speed. All right. So first off, let's talk quick, quick, quickly about the human brain. It's a wonderful thing. Right? You guys know that this is a lion. You know that this is a tiger. Right? <laughs> lion and tiger, what is it that in our brains is going on to d distinguish between these two animals? Right? There's something magical we have learned over a lifetime from the youngest times when we were watching you know, Lion King and when we ate uh, cheer uh, not Cheerios, what is this? Frosted Flakes, thank you. Tony the Tiger. There's something magical going on in our brains where we are able to learn characteristics of each animal, right? Despite this being a 3D image and this being a cartoon, we know that they're kind of similar. There's orange, orange um, fur with, with black stripes. This has a, a mane. You can even recognize that this is the female version of a, of a lion, right? There's something amazing going on as we grow up to create this feedback loop, as we learn from the data, right? This is data, and we are corrected by our parents as to, that is not a lion, that is a tiger, that is a bird. You know, we, we are creating this loop, right? That's the magical thing. Now, it doesn't really work with this, right? This is some, something's going on in our heads. We don't really know whether this is a lion or a tiger. Now, that's the feedback loop that's like, you know, as humans, we are able to um, iterate on, on a millisecond, on a second, on a day, a weekly basis. And this is kind of that thing in action. Train, predict, act. This is the, the crux of machine learning, boiled down to its essence. There's three stages. First, you know, you're training a model in your head of what a lion is and what a tiger is and what are the differences between the two. You're, when you see an image, you're predicting, oh, that is a lion or tiger. And then you act. Acting means you get feedback. You get feedback from your parents saying, nope, you were right or you were wrong, right? So you're creating this loop in your head over and over for anything you do in life, right? Whether it's, I want to touch that pot. That pot looks like a great pot to touch. Oh, I touched the pot. It's really hot. Ugh, that, that burns. And then, oh, I'm never going to touch the pot again, or I'm going to be more careful about seeing whether it's hot. This is going on in our heads. So machine learning, in essence, is teaching computers how to build this loop themselves using data, um, or using data, statistics, and software. How do you encode that amazing ability from, of, of the human brain to take in data and create a feedback loop and put it into servers and software um, and, and you know, build this at scale. That's, that's the magic of machine learning. Um, so let's take a quick example that you are all familiar with, spam detection, right? email spam detection. So you know, in, 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 sort of in the training phase of, of our machine learning system, what are we going to use as signals to, to try to identify spam versus not spam? Right? Here are some examples. Right? What are the keywords? So, so this, let's just jump ahead real quick. These are two emails from my mom on the top, and these are two emails from spammers on the bottom, right? And so when we're trying to build a statistical model to predict what's spam and what's not spam, we might look at things like the keywords present, whether there's weird content. Do I, have I seen the sender before? Is there a link to a suspicious site, right? So you can see some things like Horse Veterinary Center. That's kind of suspicious, right? Um, lots of exclamation points. That could also be suspicious. But, you know, this is actually kind of weird because my mom also uses capital letters, right? Enterprise charge you $15 fee. So it's, it, you can see where this, this breaks down. It's, it's a difficult, um, you know, nuanced problem to kind of distinguish between these two types of objects, right? Um, and, and this is where using data at scale, being able to sift out those different signals uh, is key. So, you know, going back to this loop, right? So this train, predict, act. We, we talk, this, in, in training the model, we were figuring out what signals do we want to look for. In predicting, we're applying the statistical model to the incoming data, okay? And so, oh, the, the formatting is a little off, but you guys get the idea. There's an H in front of the ORS. Um, and so, you know, 
we, we are, we are, we are make, as, as a spam classifier, we're going to make a prediction as to whether that email is spam or not spam. And Gmail will you know, show us, or will we'll send the email its way to either the inbox or to the spam folder. Right? And so in this case, for the horse veterinary, veterinary, veterinary center, you can see that it got classified as spam. Now, this is the last part. How do we provide feedback? Right? And the beautiful thing is that Gmail has this not spam button and it also has the market spam button. And there's really four possible outcomes. Right? Um, you can think about whether is it, is it not spam or did you predict that it was not spam and it actually is not spam? Then you should show the email in your inbox. Vice versa, send it to the spam folder. And these are the cases where you need to provide corrective feedback as a human. Hey, you know, turns out that this email from Netflix I actually do care about, and it's a, for a show that I, I want to watch, and it, it was not spam. So you, this is the feedback loop in action. All right. So this sets up the groundwork for what fraud detection looks like. You know, the train, predict, act. You can see the, the, the sort of parallels to, to online credit card fraud. Um, some qu other quick examples of machine learning in the real world. Facebook uh, image recognition tagging, Google self-driving cars, Netflix rec movie recommendations, uh, Google News, sort of being able to compile and, and recognize these, these articles are the same. I know I choose the greatest examples here. Um, and then, you know, uh, Amazon, Amazon reviews, being able to pluck out specific sentences and understand the sentiment behind it. That's another ex example of machine learning. Siri, that's pure machine learning, taking your speech and translating it into text. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a feedback loop, right? Like when Jason says, Siri set an alarm for 6 a.m., how does it know that that should be translated to this text? That's, that's again, that feedback loop in, in place. Nest, the learning thermostat, the same thing. Um, okay, where are we doing on time? <laughs> Eight minutes, wow. Okay, so <laughs> how do we apply to machine learning to fraud? So let me tell you a little bit about how fraud, is, fraud detection is currently done. You might, set, you might start seeing some fraud from this particular IP address as a shop owner. All right? And so you're going to set a rule saying, I want to block this IP address. Don't, I don't want to see activity from that again. Right? Or you might say, hey, this, this particular order value, let's, uh, if, if it's a large order, let's flag it for manual review. Right? And so you're going to set this line. And everything to the right, you're going to flag for, manu you're going to flag it for manual review or, or block it. And the problem with this is that you're going to be canceling orders that are actually good. Right? And so you need something that, um, you know, you're wasting time looking at orders on the, uh, to the right that you shouldn't be looking at. On the left-hand side, there's fraud that you're missing, and you're going to be losing revenue because of that fraud. So this is the way that things are done, is really building these rule-based systems that do not scale. Okay? And um, you know, there, there's a lot of challenges with the rules-based system. You're going to inaccurately flag good users. You're going to uh, have to update them constantly as new, new, fraud, new fraud is happening. You have to figure out what rules to what rules were broken? Which ones did we miss? Um, and, and you're adding all this extra friction because as a good customer, you might get inaccurately flagged by the rules-based system, and you know, you're waiting an extra day for your package to arrive. So this is the challenge with a, machine, with a, with a rules-based system. And we can do a lot better. Um, so to the extent that rules-based systems, you can think of them as a manifestation of what humans learn from their data and trying to like, encode that in a rule. Like if this, you know, the distance between the billing and shipping address is uh, more than 1,000 miles, let's make that a rule. Now, the problem with that is that it doesn't mean that there isn't fraud happening in a lower threshold, right? So you have to take a more dynamic approach. So some interesting things we've learned from our data. Um, if you capitalize your email, you're more likely to be a fraudster. If you have numbers in your email address, more likely to be a fraudster. Now, this is a good example because my personal email address actually has three digits in the email. So, you know, am I a fraudster? I don't think so, but who knows. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, the, the, the email domain itself, Gmail is much more trustworthy than, than some of these other domains, right? And so the, the key point here is that there is no black and white way to look at the world. Machine learning is able to take this dynamic view in which subtle pieces of data are combined to form this fully formed, this, this fully, uh, formed judgment. And it's all about probabilities. It's not about this fits into this box, therefore it's this. It's all about a combination of things. Just like a detective putting together a crime scene, it's never any one clue that ticks off um, a criminal or ticks off the, the crime scene. It's, it's like a combination of things. So, you know, to the extent that we are building this feedback loop, again, you have a fraud model, predict, you're predicting your, your users on your site as fraud or not fraud, and then you're going to provide feedback as to whether you got it right or wrong. Okay? So, um, really, you know, starting with your data, you have good users and bad users. Then you're going to build a model based on those examples of good and bad users. Um, you're going to find other users that are like the bad users. And oops, this power, or anyways, the idea is that you're trying to find the signals that matter 
And, and, and when, when you, when you, what you get out as output is like a fraud score. And the fraud score is like a probability of fraud. And with this, you can actually take different actions, right? You could say everything below this threshold, let's automatically accept as a um, non-suspicious transaction. Everything above 90, let's automatically reject. Everything in between, let's manually review. And you can dynamically adjust these thresholds based on the, on the nature of your business. So if you sell jewelry online, you never want to miss a fraudulent order because it's going to cost you $1,000 or more. But if you're selling you know, uh, trinkets online, $5 a piece, you're actually more OK with you know, some fraud getting through because you, want to, you care more about the customer experience. So being able to dynamically adjust that is offered by uh, machine learning. Now, we're going to. The, 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 the thing to close it all through is, is really the ability to train. And there's something called online learning where you're able to close a loop between feedback and uh, incorporating it into the model in real, t in real time instantaneously. Um, it's, we'll, we'll talk about that if we can get to it. Um, so machine learning is not a silver bullet. Let me, let me get this clear. This is not like some you know, thing that's going to take care of all of our problems for it. It is a, a very additive solution that can offer you know, orders of magnitude of productivity. But at the end of the day, you need to combine both human intelligence and machine intelligence, okay? So a good example here is machine learning can tell us that the number of digits in the email address is a great predictor of fraud, but it doesn't tell us why. Can anyone guess? Well, I'll, I'll just tell you. The reason why number of digits in, is a great predictor of fraud is because you, um, as a fraudster, want to create a bunch of disposable email addresses. So Jason123, 124, 125, 126 at gmail.com are, you want to be able to programmatically create these email addresses, right? So the ability for humans to kind of make that intuition and fill in the gaps is really important, and, and especially when you're going against an adversarial opponent, right? Um, and so you need to combine the two amazing um, technologies, our brain and the, the machine brain. Okay, so how do you know it works? We're definitely not going to get to the third part here. But um, really, there's really two main concepts to think about, precision and recall. Okay? So precision is the set of things, uh, of the set of things that we predicted as fraud, what percentage of those were actually fraudulent. All right? And so um, this is just a more visual representation of that. Recall is the inverse, which is of the things that were fraudulent, which of those did we catch? Okay? And you can think of precision as recall as, as inverse um, coefficients in that you could have 100% precision by having 0% recall. You could say everything is not fraud, and you're going to have great precision. And then inversely, you could say everything is fraud, and you're going to have great recall. Um, but you obviously want to have the right balance of those two things as you're growing your business. Um, so this, this loop, I'm going to keep showing this loop. Um, all right, actually, no. So we're getting to the third point. All right, give me, give me five minutes here. Um, so <laughs> input, input data. All right, so how do you actually build a system in your system? Or how do you actually build a system internally if you're going to add machine learning to, to fraud detection? Um, what data do you need? You can backfill as much data as you want. That's a, one of the most important concepts to take away. With machine learning, there's two things that really matter for the accuracy, for your precision and recall. The first is the quantity of data that you have. The more data you can learn from, the more accurate your scores or predictions will be. This is why Google is able to maintain such a massive lead in advertising. They make $55 billion a year because they have so much data by being the number one search engine. Second, you can bring in other third-party data sources. So maybe ge being able to geolocate an IP address, being able to verify an email address, you know, being able to look up how new an, a phone number is. You can bring in all this other, other data. Again, it goes back to the theme of getting as much data as possible. Last but not least, you want to take into account data that is specific to your business. So if you sell shoes, if you sell shoes online, you might learn that size 10 shoes are more suspicious than size 15 shoes, right? And this is all these little signals that could add up. You never know, but you want to try to bring in as much data as possible. Um, so that's the, that's the main point. Quantity of data matters a lot. Um, the second thing is, what signals are you analyzing, right? If you're, are you looking at the velocity at which someone is adding a credit card to their profile? Are you looking at the distance between the billing and shipping, IP, IP, uh, shipping address? Are you looking at the number of digits in your email address? All these little signals, you need to have a good set of signals that you're analyzing. And this, is, this combined with the quantity of data are the two biggest drivers of um, machine learning accuracy. Um, all right, so the last, we're going to get a little more technical here, and I'll, I'll just really blaze through it, but there's really two types of signals, continuous signals that have ordering. So this is a good value, where, this is a good example where there's order value is greater than $500. There is a range of order values, $0 to infinity, but there is a natural ordering to that. Um, discrete signals don't have ordering, and there's two different types of discrete signals. The first is 
it's sparse. There are many possible values, right? So IP addresses, if IPv4, there's 4 billion possible IPv, IPv4 addresses. And um, the challenge with that is that you don't have as much data, right? Because you're seeing so little activity for each IP address, it's going to be more difficult to take that into account in training your, in when, when you're learning. Um, the other type of discrete signal is dense if they kind of collide, right? So this example here where there's a shipping type, there's only three possible shipping types, and that's going to um, you know, converge onto three possible values. So th this is a bit easier to model, but this whole set, uh, selection, uh, selection of signals is, is a critical driver of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, in terms of training your models, there's a bunch of different algorithms. I've listed some of the more common um, ones here. Let's dive into a quick example of how you would build a decision tree. That's a specific type of algorithm. Um, you know, you could imagine it as, this is, this is one of the more human readable types of machine learning models, but you could start with a question like, is it an international IP address? Yes. Okay, is it a domestic credit card? Yes. Is there other multiple denied transactions? Yes. High fraud score, right? And you're able to map out this route. Now, the nice property, like I said about this, is that you're able to visualize it and debug it. That's another critical part about machine learning. Um, in terms of how do you know whether your model works, we talked about precision recall. You guys can Wikipedia the other things here. Um, but this is, this is just a quick graph, precision over recall. That's one of the more important um, or one of the easier to grok graphs. So on the left hand, on the bottom, right, left hand side, you have recall. On the right hand side, well, bottom side, you have precision. If machine learning was, if, if your machine learning system was perfect, you would imagine that this curve is up and to the right, right? So 100% precision, 100% recall. This is an example of some model tweaks that we made. We were able to get this curve going up and to the right. And this is just an easy way to visualize whether things are working or not. Um, last but not least, you know, when you apply your model, there's some interesting challenges about avoiding overfitting. Um, that's basically making assumptions based on a limited set of data that is not true. Um, and last but not least, which is yeah. Okay. So <laughs> traditional ma machine learning versus large scale machine learning. This is an example where you could analyze or okay. Uh, traditional machine learning is basically handcrafting a statistical model based on human assumptions. Large scale machine learning is looking at all possible sequences of data. Now, Google and Amazon do this. Most machine learning systems, if you take a take a, take a look under the hood, did I get cut off? Okay. No problem. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, we were like five slides away, but this was the gist of it. Thank you for listening. Um, Jason at SimScience.com. Thank you. Just, uh, yeah, who, who needs to work out when you can just do a data-driven and he talk and, and burn 2,000 calories, right? So, you wanna, so I want you to do two things. One, sit down. <laughs> two, help yourself to some water. Yeah. Uh, and we have time for like a couple of questions. One over there. Hi, uh, my name is Eric from Amora Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I just had a question at the end. <clears throat> you threw up some algorithms for uh, fraud detection, decision trees versus neural networks. I'm just curious, decision tree representing the more interpretable model, what will be a pro and con versus an interpretable model versus something like a neural network, which may be more <clears throat> nebulous? difficult in interpretation. Yeah, I mean, I think the key pro for interpretability is because machine learning is not super, is not perfectly accurate. There's going to always be that range I showed in the middle where you have to manually review. A human person needs to make a final decision as to whether it's, they're, they're going to cancel that order or not. And that human person needs as much data and context as possible. And so to the extent that you can um, show them the data in a way that makes that helps them understand why this was scored the way it was. You can show them that path. Um, that's a big part of, you know, thinking about how to build your system. But neural nets might provide more accuracy. So you actually want to have potentially a ensemble approach where you try multiple machine learning models in parallel and you're able to pick the best results and also maybe show other types of models based on their interpretability. Yeah. Okay. If you could start with your name and company as well. Catherine, I'm a writer. Um, are there times when you're trying to be predictive and you're working with data when it can be very counterproductive to work with big data? Um, I, I don't think so. I think in this context, there's actually a nice natural property of fraud detection in that there is this common enemy 
where they're the same fraudster attacking multiple sites using the same IP addresses, using the same billing addresses and shipping addresses. So to the extent that you can pool that data together, and that's one of the things that SIF Science tries to do is we build this global model that learns across all of our 175 global customers. Um, you can provide more accurate and early detection of fraud happening. I mean, there might be other cases I can't think of right now in other applications, but for fraud specifically, you really want a large, large data set. Great, thank you. So that's unfortunately all the time we have, but thank you so much for thank a you. wonderful presentation. Very educational.